Happy Sabbath, everybody. Once again, thanks for having me back. I really, I really enjoy coming here. And once again, we're going to uh, share a little bit of things about misunderstanding verses of the Bible, misunderstood things in the Bible, what we hear a lot and what we need to know to be able to pass along whenever we witness and teach, to have clear and concise information of God's Word. But first, let's uh, bow our heads in prayer. Father, we come into your house today just to thank you for all this beautiful and wonderful day, this Sabbath day that you've blessed us with, Lord. Continue to bless us. Please, Lord, pass your knowledge through me to deliver your word, Lord, not mine. Please bless us all with your Holy Spirit to be able to understand and be able to retain the knowledge and teach it. We pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. get rid of the glasses because I can't see with them on. Figure that one out. Now, like I said and mentioned in the opening, um, there are a lot of misunderstood things, but there's a lot of uh, things that are just assumed or what, you know, things like that. So let's start off with something we probably have heard before. Um, that the Sabbath couldn't have been a creation and couldn't have been a commandment because Adam and Eve didn't keep the Sabbath. There's nowhere in the Bible that tells us that Adam and Eve kept the Sabbath. But, let's take a little deeper look in this, right? That's their argument, that's what people say. Let's turn to Genesis, chapter 2, verse 1 through 3, and I'll read. Thus the heavens and the earth, and all the host of them, were finished. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. So what did he do on the seventh day? He rested. Then. That is an afterword. It's not before. Then. Okay? Then God blessed the seventh day. He sanctified it. He set it apart from the other six. The other six, he says, we're at work. But only this day, he blessed. Because he rested from all his work and created it. And God had made it and created it. Um, it's the only day that God blessed and made holy. It's his rest that made the day holy. See, God's rest during the first Sabbath day was an example to all men. Adam and Eve could not have kept the Sabbath. If God would have commanded them to keep the Sabbath, well, first of all, he couldn't have kept the Sabbath because God rested that day and didn't bless it until after he rested. His rest is what made the Sabbath. And for God to command Adam and Eve to keep the Sabbath would have been kind of hypocritical, wouldn't you say? Why? They hadn't worked six days. God says six days you shall work, but on the seventh day, you're going to keep his, his uh, Sabbath holy. Right? And a lot of people out there say, no, the Sabbath was for the Jews. Well, I don't know anywhere in the Bible that says the Sabbath was for the Jews. I know that Jesus said the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. I am Lord of the Sabbath, Jesus said. So that includes all men, right? Mm -hmm. And let's just give, it a, uh, give them the benefit of the doubt. If they said the Sabbath was made for the Jews, well, were the Jews the Israelites, God's chosen people? Were they to deliver the message to the rest of the world? When the Sabbath law and the Ten Commandments were given on Sinai, were they new or were they reiterated? They were reiterated. Why? They had been in bondage for 400 years. They lost their touch with the true God. They lost what their father Abraham had learned. See, God chose the Israelites for a reason. Because their father was Abraham. And in Genesis 26, verse 5, I believe, it says that 
God found favor in Abraham because Abraham obeyed his commandments, charges, statutes, and laws. Now, what commandments would those have been? The Ten Commandments, correctly. So if Israel carried this on to teach the rest of the world, and they were literal, it says in the Bible that if we believe in Jesus Christ, we are grafted in. And we are an heir to the promise made to Abraham. We are a spiritual Jew. So if it were for the Jews, and we are grafted in because we believe in Christ, don't you think the Sabbath would apply to all men that believe in Christ? Amen. All right? Amen. Amen. See, we are the Gentiles, but we are a Jew on the inside. Paul said there are Jews on the inside, and then there are Jews that are outward that aren't really Jews because they rejected Jesus Christ. See, to accept you, to, to become in Jesus and accept Christ, you become a Jew, a spiritual Jew on the inside. Therefore, you're an heir to the promise given to Abraham. And what was that promise? The kingdom of heaven. God said, I'll make a great nation out of you. So, Adam and Eve didn't keep that first Sabbath, but I'm sure that they kept every Sabbath afterwards. Amen. And I'm sure that up until the time that God's word was lost and Moses had to reintroduce it, there were people that obeyed God's laws. We know Enoch was translated because God, he walked with God. Right? We know that Elijah was taken to heaven in a whirlwind, right? And we know that Moses' his body was resurrected and taken to heaven. And God found favor in them because they obeyed his charges, his statutes, commandments, and laws. We as a man, as a woman, as mankind, all men, are to obey all ten of the commandments. And I know that we know that, right? But there's a bunch of people that are out there right now that are being led blindly that don't know this. And we are to be a witness to God's word and to share the Sabbath truth. And to share all the commandments. Now I could go into a story that I had, but I don't think we're going to have a whole lot of time. I'd like to share it with you if you want to hear it one of these days. Excuse me as I take a quick drink. Okay. There's a verse in the Bible, and it's in Matthew 24, 38 through 41. Matthew 24, 38 through 41. But we're going to start a little backwards. We're going to start with verse 40. And it talks about when Jesus talks about his coming on that day, there'll be one taken and one left. One taken and one left. And a lot of people teach this wrong, and it's very important that we get this right. Because you're going to see why here in a second. So I'm going to start with verse 40. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken, the other left. Okay, so one will be taken, the other left. Now what's the word left? The word left is a remnant word, right? So let's read on. Let's go back to 38. For as in the days before the flood, there were eating and drinking, marrying and giving marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. What did it do? Who was taken? The wicked. Who was left? Noah and his family. Right? So we must understand this. Let's go to Luke 17, 28 to 30. And I'll read. 28. 
Likewise, as it was in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Now, who did it destroy? And who was left? Lot, his family. See, left is a remnant word. And when we don't, okay, let's read verse 30 first. Even so it will be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. What day is that? That's at Christ's second coming. It's going to be the same way. There will be people taken and there will be people left. Now who will be left? The righteous. The righteous. A small remnant, right? So we must understand that one taken, one left. This opens up the door for people who believe in a seven-year tribulation, which the Bible does not teach. And I'm going to show you through Scripture. Because this is the Holy Bible. We either believe 100% of it or we believe none of it. This word is to be taken for its word. It's to be compared Scripture with Scripture so that we get a true meaning. So, the people out there, that 95% of the Christians out there, they believe right now. They believe that there's a seven-year tribulation, some secret rapture coming. And the people will be taken to heaven. And the wicked will still be left on earth. And for seven years. And then they say that the temple will be built, rebuilt. They're looking over there right now in Israel. Everyone's looking to Israel when they should be looking to Rome. Everyone's looking to Israel right now, and everyone's saying that we're going to build a temple. We're going to get a red heifer. The Antichrist has got to come and sit in that temple. He'll make a seven-year covenant with the house of Israel, and in three and a half years, he'll break that covenant. And then there'll be kings from the north and kings from the east, Russia, Russia, China, everybody, and this and that. That's not what the Bible teaches. Not in any way, shape, or form. The Bible teaches, let's go to, let's go to, uh, let's go to this. Let me, let me just say this. They think that they're not going, uh, they think they're not going to go through a tribulation. A lot of the Christians. Okay, they believe that they're not. They believe they're going to be taken away. Did Noah go through the flood or was he taken from it? He went through it. Did the children of Israel go through the plagues in Egypt, or were they taken from them? They went through them. Did Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, did they go through the fire, or were they taken from them? They got thrown in the fire, right? Did Daniel go through the lion's den, or was he taken from them? Did Jesus Christ go through the tribulation of the cross for us, or was he taken from Were the martyrs in the dark ages taken from it, or did they go through the tribulation? Millions of martyrs murdered. So why would God all of a sudden change his way or his historical flow and just take people out of tribulation? Tribulation builds the character. It's a test of our faith. It's the way that God can see. If you know the story of the Millerite movement, you're going to know a huge test of faith because a disappointment came. In 1843, God saw whose faith was tested, who was loyal. That's going to happen. We have had tribulation from the day Jesus ascended into heaven. And we're going to continue to go through tribulation as a test of faith. Until the very end. Right? So left, when you hear one taken, one left, we need to understand when we teach this, that the ones taken are going to be the wicked. And the ones left are going to be the righteous. Let's see what scripture has to say about that. What is it? What exactly happens when Jesus Christ returns? Well, Jude 14 and 15, verses 14 and 15, now read.
Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men, also saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousand of his saints. Saints are angels. When the Lord comes, he's coming with all the angels of heaven, the Bible tells us, right? To execute judgment on all. Will all be judged? To execute judgment on all. To convict all who are ungodly. Among them, of all of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way, and all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So when he comes, there's going to be a judgment. There's going to be two groups. There's going to be a righteous, and there's going to be a wicked. And when God comes, he knows who's in those groups. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6 through 10. And I'll read. Paul writes here to the Thessalonians, and he says, Since, it's a, since it is righteous, a, a righteous thing with God to repay with tribulation those who trouble you, and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from the heavens with his mighty angels. What day is that? That's when he's coming. And in Jude, he said with the saints, and, and uh, Paul writes here, on the day that he's revealed with his mighty angels. Right? In flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God, on those who do not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. These, who are these? The wicked. The wicked shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he comes in that day, what day again is this? Second coming of Christ. When he's coming in that day to be glorified in his saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. So right here, we're seeing scripture that tells us that when Christ comes, the ungodly are going to be destroyed by the glory of his coming. He's going to take vengeance on them. And all those who don't obey with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. So, now, so to speak, let's look at one more scripture, which I like to say, this one pretty much puts the whole idea of the seven-year tribulation to rest. It puts the nail on the cop to make it understood, right? Let's go to 1 Thessalonians, chapter 4, verse 15 through 17. Chapter 4, verse 15 through 17. And I'll read. Paul writes here to the Thessalonians again. He says, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. Let's go back. For that we who are alive and remain Remember, there's two groups. So, the ones who are alive and remain, who do you think those are? The righteous. the righteous. It doesn't say, for we who all are alive and some will remain and some won't. It says, for all who remain. And it says, For the Lord himself will descend from the heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. The righteous dead will rise first. The wicked dead won't rise. The dead in Christ will rise first. Then we, who are alive and remain, so we are alive and remain, shall be caught up together in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Thus we shall all be with the Lord. So this is a, a, a visual of the righteous being raised, the remaining remnant that are still alive, 
joining up and meeting the Lord God in the air. Now, where are the wicked? They're dead. Because right after this, we're taught that Satan, an angel comes down from heaven and locks Satan on the earth for a thousand years with nothing to do. See, Satan's in torture. He's going to be tortured for a thousand years by his demons that he misled. They're going to kick him around like a soccer ball. <laughs> you did this to us. You led us here. If you're in a church right now watching this on video, and you're being taught this, get out of that church. Because it's no, there's no idea what else they're teaching incorrectly. We know that by Scripture, Scripture teaches us correctly. And this is very dangerous to understand because it goes back to our Sabbath school lesson. That people aren't preparing, people aren't ready for today, the day of salvation. People think they have time. The time is now. So if this is being taught to you, or to people you know, Get away. Run. It's not the truth. You're being deceived. When Christ comes, there will be two groups. I'm going to reiterate this. There will be two groups. A wicked group and a righteous group. When he comes, the wicked will be destroyed at the glory and power of his coming. Scripture backs that up. I can even go into Revelation and pull scripture from chapter 19. But I think this made the point. I think if you can't get this, you're not going to understand any of it. Okay? So, Christ comes, the wicked are destroyed, the red dead in Christ rise, the righteous dead in Christ rise, the righteous that remain and are alive, the angel to gather and bring up to meet the Lord in the air. And then we will be going to heaven for a thousand years. Amen. I, I look for that day. Amen. I don't care if that's a day when I'm dead. I don't care if that's a day if I'm alive. But I look for that day. Lord. Come, Lord, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come. Amen. Amen. Let's pray real quick. Father, thank you so much for allowing me to preach your word, Lord. Thank you so much for guiding me with your spirit. And I pray that people watching this on video and the people that heard it in this room, that in this church, that they just, uh, they understand that the time is now. Salvation is today. Today is the day of salvation, Lord. Please work your Holy Spirit deep into our hearts and in our minds to help us understand your word, Lord, to live your word, Lord. We just pray this prayer and we thank you on this Sabbath day. In the Lord Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen.